Roadkill Extra appears every single weekday at Motor Trend On Demand. It's a show that gives you question and answer sessions, deeper looks into our project vehicles, behind the scenes stuff, and here's a sample right now of one of the shows that you missed last week on MotorTrendOnDemand.com. You can watch them all with a 30-day free trial. Hey, it's Freiberger. Today I'm out here at Nelson Supercars in Chatsworth, California, which is the home of the F-Bomb, my 73 Camaro that I think a lot of you know about. And I get questions about this car as it relates to roadkill all of the time. And so I thought I would address some of those here on the show and also give you a little bit of a walk around in the car. Now, first of all, uh, this car is 1973 Camaro. I bought it at the Pomona Swap Meet. I actually traded it for an intake manifold and a couple hundred bucks. And way back in, I think, 2003, maybe 2004, could have been 2002, right in that neighborhood, Tom Nelson got with me. He's like, dude, I want to put a small block in a Camaro. I need to do R&D some production manifolds for a turbo kit. Can I borrow your Camaro? So I sent it out to his place, which is another location, Chatsworth. And next thing I knew, he's like, we're going to build this whole car. And he just rips into it, and they start building the whole car. And he had one vision of it. I had a slightly different one. We both wanted to do a street car that could also go drag racing and do top speed stuff, but also drive across the country or do anything like that. He wanted a real pro touring look, and he wanted the thing to be black, just straight up black. And I'm like, man, nobody is going to remember that. And so I want to do this, army green, with the World War II nose art on the side, which I also sort of sketched on a napkin and had a guy paint for me. And Nelson was like, army green, oh, that's going to be the worst thing ever. But in fact, I think it is what has made this car memorable. If this was just another all-black Pro Touring 73 Camaro, nobody would remember it. But the other reason people remember the car is that it was in one of the Fast and Furious movies. And honestly, I can't even remember which one. It's either four or five. And uh, my director is off camera right now going, it was four. It was four. So yeah, it was Fast and Furious 4. Um, a lot of people are like, how could you let them smash your car like that? Well, that's not how the movie industry works. They took the vision of this car and duplicated it. I believe they built five models of the F-bomb. It might have been four. But they bought a bunch of real cars. They painted them like this. They put the same wheels and tires on them. They gave them the same stance. But they just had regular old small block Chevys in them. And that's what they used to smash them up in the movie. And for those big wheel standing scenes, I'll give you a secret about that, too. Everyone's like, your F-bomb, it can do wheelies on dirt. Well, that car had a big cantilever off the back of it that had 3,000 pounds of lead weights on a bar that came and welded all the way here forward in the car. And it was an angle up against the back of it. And it had a stock 350 Chevy in the car. But you could get in the thing and whack the throttle, and it would just pick up the front end. We were doing wheelies on it inside a warehouse, sort of on a surface like this one when they were building that car for the movie. And so that was a lot of fun. But long story short, this isn't actually the car that was in the Fast and Furious movies. It's just the model of what they were. And of course, it also appeared in Hot Rod Magazine at the time. We did a complete buildup of the thing. Um, let's talk about what the F-bomb is today. Uh, it's been sitting around for a long, long time. The problem is me being super busy with magazine work and also now with video work and Tom Nelson being as busy as he is building cars and engines and a new shop and all sorts of crazy stuff. We haven't had this at the drag strip as often as we would like to to really get it perfected. I claimed a long time ago the thing would go eights, and I think we've been to the drag strip four times with it, three times with a power glide transmission, and ultimately we gave up on that because it was just blowing through the converter. It would go all the way down the track at 7,000 RPM. I would shift, and it wouldn't even drop RPM. It was just not great. So it has a Mike's Transmissions Turbo 400 in it now, and uh, a converter that was done by a friend of Tom's, and finally we got the thing on an unprepped track to run 90 or 908 at 156 miles an hour. So we're that close, but I also really have not dialed in the suspension program on it. It's got a drag radial on it and Caltrax bars and leaf springs, and the car's really heavy in the nose. This thing weighs more than 4,000 pounds, and we have not put the time in that we need to to really dial in the suspension to be able to leave with the car. I've been just leaving off idle. We haven't been able to use the trans breaker build up boost. So that's a lot of excuses for the fact that we both have just been too busy to, to really dial it in but we've put a lot of miles on the car it's been driven around by a lot of people and uh, it's pulled it out it's held up in really good shape it's really the same as it was when we started 
all the way down to the long block, which is the same 406 cubic inch motor that I had in Hot Rod Magazine ages ago. Um, looks like we've got it apart just a little bit right now. Um, it's the same long block. We've taken it apart a couple times and looked at it just to sort of R&D the engine assembly. And uh, the bearings on this thing have been perfect, even after cranking out 1,500 horsepower on the dyno. This thing is really comfortable at uh, like 1,000 horsepower level, drive it every single day on pump gas, no big deal. It idles like a 400 horsepower stocker. It's really easy to drive. You crank up the boost, it can make as much as 1,500. It's got a uh, forge crank billet rods, uh, Lunati bottom end. It has a uh, World Products block, Brodix heads in it. All of that stuff has been really, really in good shape when we've taken it apart. The most recent time that Nelson Supercars did that, they pulled the engine out and uh, just cleaned it all up and put it back together with Nelson's mirror image turbos. You can see that these turbos, the, the scroll on them is a mirror image of each other. It makes it much easier to package in the car than the old type of turbos that only go one direction. And so you've got one going this way and one going this way, and it's always a packaging problem. Their guys hand built this whole thing. They built a wooden buck and tapped it out and welded it together out of two pieces. Um, you can see it's apart right now. I think they needed to, to borrow some blow off valves off the thing. Um, but other than that, that cosmetic dress up really, it's the same car that it has been since we first put the thing together. I'm trying to remember if there's any other significant changes outside of the transmission. I don't think so. It's a stock front suspension, tubular control arms, leaf spring rear, Caltrax bars, automatic. It's got Willwood brakes on it. These are the wheels that have been on the thing. Uh, these I actually stole off the CarCraft Disco Nova project car when we were putting that thing together. That's a, a Mickey Thompson wheel that they don't make anymore, unfortunately. And uh, Tom had them powder coated in sort of a chrome black, which has been a cool look for the thing. Same wheels in the back. They're 15 by 10s. The drag radial that is on this thing is a 325 50 15. I think the next time I go to the track, I'm going to put an actual slick on this rather than a drag radial, just because we've been messing with that for a while. And like I said, I need to work out the suspension on it. It does have QA1 shocks all the way around. Uh, the interior on it is, for me, one of the coolest parts of it, just because it is so sort of aircraft. You can see it's got like the punch plates holding the roll cage to the A pillars and uh, Kirky racing seats. This is a, a cool, instead of a horn button, it's just a solid piece of aluminum that we painted with the sort of dogfight scene there. It's got a TCI shifter. If you look down here at the shifter, you can see all sorts of stuff going on. It's got uh, the turbo boost controller there, TCI outlaw pistol grip shifter, trans brake button. The car does also have a gear vendor's overdrive, which is controlled by the foot. The two levers there, one of them is for the parachute and the other one is a remote battery cutoff. It does have two batteries in the trunk. The whole thing is controlled by electromotive. It's got the Lambda sensor up here on the dash so that when I'm going down the track, I can just make sure that we're not leaning the thing out and killing the motor. One of the things I really like about this car's interior is if you know a stock second gen Camaro interior, know that the bottom half of the dash is a whole bunch of plastic. It normally hangs down to about here. And we eliminated all of that. You can see on the other side, it's just got a punch plate where normally you would have a glove box and stuff and just use the stock pad and an insert with all of the auto meter gauges. That gives you more leg room and it just gives the car a cleaner look. It's less plasticky. One of the things I've never hooked up on the car and really need to if we ever get around to running the thing at a top speed event is fire bottles. The fire bottles have been in there a long time, probably need to be recertified and everything. I miss the car. It ends up sitting here at Nelson Supercars more often than it ends up being at my place just because it's used so often for like promotional stuff and R&D stuff and for shows and, and things like that. But when I do have this thing at home, believe me, it's awesome. You just turn the key, fire it up, you can drive it anywhere. I think the worst part about the car is probably the all aluminum seat with no padding in it. You're sitting right down on the ground, it rides a little stiff, it's kind of hard on you. But other than that, you can drive this thing anywhere, anytime. And maybe someday you'll even see the F-bomb in an episode of Roadkill.
Here's what you missed last week on Roadkill Extra, exclusively on Motor Trend On Demand. 1978 Lincoln Continental. This is the last of the really, really huge American cars. The F-Bomb, my 73 Camaro. If this was just another all-black Pro Touring 73 Camaro, nobody would remember it. We covered every square inch of the car with speed decals. If you need more Roadkill Extra, go sign up for the 30-day free trial 